we are, that's up our alley right there. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> it's, uh, <laughs> it's, we are, we are flavor, like that's our, that's our qualification. The diabetic church vomiting. <laughs> Maybe so, but we are happy, right? Like we are happy. I don't know what. All those people eating carrot sticks, they are not this happy today. I can promise you that. They're hungry. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I just offended everyone in here who likes carrots. All right. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, I've already been told that a number of you, you're, you've come locked and loaded with some questions, uh, which is fantastic. So uh, let me just ask if there's someone who would be willing to volunteer to open the hour in prayer. And then uh, if someone also would be willing to read Romans 1, 1 through 7 for us again. And then once we do those two things, we will open it up to discussion and questions. Uh, anyone willing to read? Let me ask that first. Anyone really willing to read Romans 1, 1 through 7? Andrew, you got that? Uh, this Andrew, sorry. This different. Andrew, one, we got to come up with like a nickname. Drew. Yeah, there you go. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, someone willing to pray for us. <clears throat> no pressure, no pressure, no pressure, Baffy. All right, go ahead and open us up. Go ahead with uh, Romans 1, 1 through 7. <clears throat> That's all right. There you have it. Um, so I guess l let's just, well, let me, let me do this. While you're generating your questions, let me give you a little bit of just connection with the book of Acts here. I, I said earlier we can, we can narrow down the date of the writing of the book of Romans pretty specifically. Um, <clears throat> and that's because of, of the way that it can be cross-referenced with some other passages in Scripture. So um, Romans 16, uh, the very end of the book, uh, gives evidence um, that Paul probably wrote the book of Romans from the city of Corinth. So we, he, we find him staying in Corinth uh, during his final missionary journey in Acts chapter 2. Um, he mentions that Phoebe, <clears throat> in chapter 16, verse 12 of Romans, Phoebe um, was probably the, the courier. She was probably... Phoebe was probably the person who was taking the letter to Rome. Um, and it says that Phoebe is from Sancria. Sancria is a port city of Corinth. Okay, so, so Paul then is probably in Corinth, and he's part of the little church that he started there, and meets Phoebe, uh, who's from the port town nearby, and Phoebe becomes the one who takes the letter to Rome. Um, chapter 16, verse 23, Paul says he is residing currently with a man named Gaius. Now, Gaius is also mentioned in 1 Corinthians 1.14. He's a resident of the city of Corinth. And it's quite likely that this is the same Gaius. So Paul is probably writing from the house of Gaius, who also housed the church in Corinth, 
Uh, he's writing this letter to the Romans. And then he mentions Erastus, uh, who is called the city treasurer. Uh, and this might be the same person uh, who served as the Roman magistrate. Um, his name is mentioned in 2 Timothy chapter 4. And, and his position was what the Romans called an ideal. Uh, I think I'm pronouncing it right. It's A-E-D-I-L-E. And this person's position was someone who was responsible for public buildings, uh, the public games, like, like the, the Olympic-type games that they would play, <clears throat> and the supply of grain to the city. Uh, well, this individual, Erastus, was said to have served or be serving as the Roman magistrate in this ideal position in Corinth. Uh, and we find that in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20. So you take all that together and the other factors of, of the timing of Paul's travels uh, through Asia in particular, and, and it's, it's a pretty specific time period here between A.D. 55 and 58, probably written from Corinth um, as Paul's making his final round through the churches collecting the offering that he's going to take back to Jerusalem to aid those who were in the, 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 the famine um, and in need in the church there in Jerusalem. So that kind of locates us, at least on the timeline uh, of, of uh, the, the, the history here a little bit, at least as best we, excuse me, as best we can. All right? So, so there's a little bit more of the background, but with that, let me just turn it over to you. What questions do we have? And what a, like, it's pretty obvious Paul never, like, I don't think Paul ever did anything halfway, right? Like, like, like as a Jew, he was like, I'm a, I'm a, like, I'm a, I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees, man. Like, I, I, I know this stuff. Uh, according to the law, I am, I am zealous. Um, never did anything halfway. Uh, but, but how unique, too, that God would have raised up someone like Paul, who likely would have had most of the Old Testament memorized, to be the apostle then, to write books like Romans and Galatians, to help us understand exactly what he says here in this first few verses, that the, the gospel that he is proclaiming is not new. And how qualified was he then to lean on that knowledge of the Old Testament that he had grown up under, to then be able to, to, to teach other people to go, let me show you how this connects. Let, let me show you why this is not something new. Um, so he's uniquely qualified, I think, for the task that God called him to do. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, if, if, he can, if he can transform someone who was so zealously committed to the Jewish religion, and, and really ultimately was a false understanding of the Jewish religion, so zealously committed to that that he would be willing to kill Christians for it. Uh, if, if he can turn that kind of heart, uh, what can he do? Uh, he can certainly change the rest of the story. So, I probably not, probably not. So, so eighty fifty five to fifty eight um, puts this right near the the beginning of Nero's reign, and Nero's reign doesn't really go sideways into like persecuting Christians until a little later. Um, what has happened up until this point, though, is that about ten years 
prior, um, the, the previous Roman emperor had decreed that all Jews were to be expelled from Rome. <clears throat> and this is fascinating. We learn about this from a, um, from a Roman historian uh, about a century later, he's writing some of the history of Rome. <clears throat> and in it, he mentions this decree from the emperor. And he says that the reason the emperor made the decree was because the Jews were stirring up people under the service of, like they were following some guy named Crestus. C-H-R-E-S-T-U-S. And almost all scholars agree that that was a misunderstanding on the historian's part, that it was actually Christus, the Christ. Um, Christus was a very common Grecian name uh, in the first century, so the mistake would have been understandable and, and likely this guy not understanding who Christus was. Um, and, and so likely what happened is there, there's this stir that's caused by the Jews. You see this in all of Paul's letters, especially in Acts, as he's traveling around everywhere he goes and brings the gospel, who stirs up the people? Who causes the problem? It's the Jews, right? Like, like almost every time they show up and they claim that, that Paul is a rabble rouser, that he's, he's creating dissension and, and, and issues. And so, again, it's quite possible if we're piecing the, the, the history together here appropriately that um, people who were in Jerusalem for Pentecost are confer converted, discipled, returned to Rome. They start spreading the message of this Christus which Christ is simply Messiah, right? They, they, they start spreading the message that Messiah has come, right? And, and this talk in the, 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 the Jewish synagogues in Rome was causing dissension. And Rome doesn't like dissension. Rome doesn't like turmoil and trouble. They, they squash that sort of thing. And so the emperor was like, not in my town, right? And he just boots the Jews out of Jerusalem entirely. Um, and, and so... Uh, some of these individuals that Paul meets in Corinth, uh, as a matter of fact, um, um, oh goodness, their, their names escape me. The, the husband and wife that discipled Apollos, Priscilla and Aquila, right, uh, were from Rome, uh, but Paul meets them in, uh, in Ephesus. Why? Because they, they had been forced out um, and were gone for a time. By A.D. 50, 51, somewhere in that, in that time frame, with the passing of Claudius, the previous emperor, his decree would have ended with his death. So Jews started to return, right, started to re-immigrate uh, to Rome, um, and, and, but the, the church had continued. Uh, it had continued under Gentile leadership and Gentile authority. Um, so probably not persecuted, but probably this weird scenario where Jews are returning and finding a church that has been under Gentile leadership now for a number of years, and probably why Paul spends three chapters in Romans talking about the challenge, the difficulty of the gospel when it comes to, like, what does this mean for Israel, and what does it mean for us, and how do we integrate that difficulty um, in our current understanding of the gospel? Um, so, not persecution per se, but just kind of a weird set of circumstances. But persecution is definitely coming uh, with with Nero's reign. A little bit more of our historical perspective. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, one, one of two things here. Either he is lumping in all the rest of the apostles here, or he's using, um, sometimes authors use we, uh, the, the plural, just to refer to themselves. That's a fairly common, um, some people do that. Uh, I do that sometimes. When I'm talking about things that I do. Sometimes I use the plural, we, and I, I really just mean me. Um, so it's either that Paul is using the plural here as kind of the, the, the author's right or privilege to say that. Also possible that he's lumping in the other 12 um, at the same time, going, this is what we, as the group of apostles, have received 
and, and, and he calls it the, uh, we have received grace and apostleship. I think it's better to read this as uh, we have received um, a gracious apostleship, right? Or an apostleship through grace. Um, to say grace and apostleship, it sounds like that he's referring to salvation, right? We received grace, and then we received apostleship on top of that. Bless you. Um, but it, it's more likely that he's talking about, again, we received this apostleship. It was given to us by grace. Um, it was not something that we earned. It was not something that we deserved. Uh, it was a gracious receiving, a gracious gifting that God has given to us. Absolutely. Yeah, this, this was something that, um, this caused a problem for me for a long time. Um, I, I finished seminary, like I went all the way through seminary going, I, I had heard, I had heard stories, uh, you hear them all the time of people who are called, I, I was friends with people who, uh, you know, claim to have uh, like very clear experiences um, and <clears throat> in moments in their life where they're like, this is what. This is what God wants me to do. Um, and I just never had that. That might come as a shock to some of you. Like, I, I've never had that, not, e not even once. <laughs> um, the, the pathway into what I'm doing now has just been one of uh, training and, and equipping and opportunity that then gets confirmed by the churches in which the opportunity has been given. Um, I'm, I'm here this morning. Not because I said, hey, you know what I want to do, right? I'm going to go over to this church over here and knock on the door and tell them uh, God called me to come be your pastor. No, I, I am here, and I, I will promise you, and Lacey can, can back me up on this, the only reason I am still here, it, because there have been over a decade, as you can imagine, there, there are plenty of times where you might go, eh, I don't know. <laughs> like, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe this is not the thing. Maybe this is not what God wants. You, you know why I'm still here? I look back not on some calling that God gave me. I look back on all of those people in that other church who said, we've prayed and we've sought the Lord, and we believe God has gifted you for this, right? Uh, so, so Peter encourages Timothy the same way. He, he's like, hey, uh, remember the laying on of the hands of the elders. But what was that? That was his commission. That was confirmation from the others around him who had watched him, who had observed him, who had been part of, you know, Timothy's ministering in their lives. And those individuals went, yes, we believe you are gifted to do this, Timothy. So they laid hands on him, prayed, commissioned him to the task of pastor or elder. And Paul's like, hey, when, when, you're, when you're having down days, when you're doubting what you're doing, when you're feeling insecurities, remember my people laid their hands on you, right? And, and again, this is why uh, Paul and Timothy, uh, when he's writing to Timothy and when he writes to Titus, these two young pastors, he lists qualifications for elders, right? He doesn't say, hey, verify that they have received a legitimate call from God. No, no, he's saying observe their life, right? Observe their life. See who they are. Um, participate in their ministry and, and make your evaluation based on that. And, and so, so that, was, that was an issue for me because I'd never had it. God has just kind of, 
like, like just here we are, right? Like there was no like light bulb moment, uh, lightning flashes from heaven, uh, none of that. And what I started to notice over time is that the people who did have those, they're like, you know, they, they uh, some of them were like, well, I am, I am called to this region of the world to go as, as missionaries. And they're like interns brokers today. Like they just never even left. Um, and, and, you, and, and, and others who were called into pastoral ministry, um, and, and you step back at some point and you go, man, like, like they've either abandoned the faith entirely or they, they left ministry altogether. Um, and, and I just think, like, I understand, and, and I don't, like, I don't make this a point of, um, I'm not going to argue with people over how you use the word calling. Like, I get it. I understand what you mean. But I do think if we're not careful, it creates confusion, both for churches who are seeking pastors um, and seeking to give support to missions work, and for those who are kind of coming up through that education system and, and, and feeling like because I'm being educated this way, I am confirmed in this calling. That's, that's where we create a lot of confusion. And the system as it is set up right now is, is what do you do? I mean, let, let's, let's say I kill over dead this afternoon because the Super Bowl is just so exciting, my heart explodes, right? And, and I die. What, what would be, what would, what, like, what would we do as a church? What would you do as a church? Well, the, the typical process is you would put out the feelers, like we put out, you know, who knows someone, uh, and, and generally the qualifications are what degree do they have, right? What degree do they have? Um, and so we want to we want to make sure they have the proper education. Uh, we want to make sure they come from the proper pedigree, right? Like like their doctrine and our doctrine is gonna gonna basically align. Um, and, and we want to know that they're they're an interesting and good speaker because no one wants to fall asleep every single Sunday. Uh, and we want to make sure they're not going to, through, you know, terrible administration, just run the church into the ground financially, okay? So, so they're, they're like, are they, are they fairly decent at business? Are they fairly decent at administrating people? Uh, are they good speakers? Or do they have a great education, right? Uh, and do they fit our, our level of doctor? Like, like, we're looking for all of these things. And, and when it comes to the Bible, like, the only thing of any of those, uh, it's like that, that, that rises to the level of significance is, is can they handle the Word of God rightly? which might require some education, right? some, some intentional discipleship along the way. Uh, we just have it backwards, man. We, we just, seminaries pump out people with degrees, and we just assume that those people are qualified and should serve, that they are called. And this is why I think having this discussion every once in a while is really helpful, uh, because I, I think we've kind of messed it up a little bit. Yes, sir. They've arrived. They've arrived. Yeah, and you know, and, and yet the reality too is like like this the, the idea of calling then filters out and has filtered out into you know every other aspect of life. And so um, it, the, the offshoot of that is like, well, am I called to marry this person? You know, am I sure? Am I am I called to move here? Am I called into this profession? And you know what that causes in us? A ton of anxiety. There's a ton of anxiety because it's like, I, I don't know. And like, how do I know? I, I can search the scripture and, and like, what confidence can I have? Because nowhere in there does it say, did it ever say, uh, you know, hey, this, this woman that you're dating, she's the one, right? It, it's just not there. Uh, and so I, I just want to be very, very cautious, very careful um, that when we use the term, we're not using it in such a way that's going to create that kind of confusion and anxiety in the hearts of the people who, who I mean, if we're honest, they genuinely want to serve the Lord. They genuinely want to be obedient. And when we use the terminology in this way, I think we can uh, cause some confusion and, and trouble for those people.
you, you know what this, what this conversation intersects with is that the reality is a lot of times I think when we use the term calling, what we really mean is I want to. Right? Like, like, like I have a desire to do it. And, and we're, we're a little scared of that. We're, we're a little scared of that as Christians. It's like, oh, you know, don't trust your heart, right, because, uh, because it will lead you into all kinds of trouble. Um, but if, if God is working in our lives, well, what does he tell us? He's like, I will give you the desires of your heart. I will order your steps. The steps of a good man, right? Like, uh, so, so there are all of these promises that he is going to guide and direct our steps, and I think he works through our desires to do that. He works through our talents to do that. Um, to say, you know what? I, I understand you might want this, you might have a desire for it, but you're not really cut out for that, right? So let's let's shift directions over here. Um, I, I think in, in Christian circles we tend to stress out about things that that God never intended us to stress out so much over. Um, just, just trust me. Uh, I will give you right desires, right? I will steer your path. I will, I will chart your course. I will order your steps. You just be faithful to me, right? And I'll take care of the rest. Um, so, yeah, we start with a desire, and we, we get godly counsel. We get godly input, and we, uh, we, we seek wisdom, and we ask what the Lord wants. And at the end of the day, like I'll never forget, I, re- I read a book a while back. Uh, the title of the book was Just Do Something. Just Do Something. It was written by a pastor. And his point was that in the Christian life, God holds us accountable to be obedient to the clear commands of Scripture. And outside of that, there is a tremendous amount of freedom to just make decisions, just do things, uh, rather than walking around in the fear that I'm going to step outside of my calling or get something wrong and mess up my whole life. Um, that, that's too much pressure. Yes, sir. Yeah, for sure. It, it's um. So, so there, is, there, there is, and I think what you're hitting on is, is there's absolutely a danger that if I, if I put all my eggs in the basket of how I feel, that's that's trouble, right? Because as we've said before, feelings come and go. Like like feelings are fickle based on the time of the week, your uh, your time of the month, your age, what you had for dinner last night. Like like feelings can be all over the map, right, up and down. So, so if I am putting all my eggs in the feeling basket, I'm in trouble. Um, but as I am walking with the Lord, right, I can't discount my feelings. You know what I'm saying? Like, like they, they do factor in. And I feel like on the one hand, we, we're so suspicious, so suspicious of our, of our desires and feelings um, that we just always want to discount them. And, and, and you know what that leads to? I think it leads to just misery. <laughs> I think it leads to misery um, that because we're we're so afraid, uh, some of us to to be happy, and to do things that we might enjoy, um, because there's a there's this unfortunate misunderstanding that Christianity means, you know, some sort of uh, masochistic, you know, de- self denial of every good thing, um, and that is just that's not gospel either. So yeah, hundred percent. Never put all of your eggs in the feelings basket. And that's where wisdom comes into play, right? And, and so what wisdom does, wisdom comes along and says, you, you've got these options in front of you, and it's not clear which one you should take. That, that's where wisdom comes along to aid us in that part of the decision-making, that part of life. Um, and wisdom is going to take into account the leading of God through our emotions and our desires and our, our giftedness. And a lot of times um, what, what wisdom is going to do is come in, through the voices of other people who see, right, and who know us and are going to give us input. That's why in the multitude of counsels there is safety, right? Uh, wisdom is, is going to um, cause us to lean into the Lord and consider bigger questions like what is my purpose? <laughs> why am I here? If I am here to serve the gospel, ultimately, Romans chapter 1, 
if I am here to serve the gospel, will this decision help or harm that overarching purpose? All right, like there are, there are like upper level questions that we can ask about that. But yeah, for certain, wisdom, wisdom enters into the picture, um, but our emotions are going to be part of that decision making process. Good stuff. See, Cheryl, I think that all came from one question. What else from the passage? Maybe question, maybe just something that you found particularly encouraging or, or challenging as a thought from the passage. scan through, make sure there was nothing else that I had thought of to bring up. <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, like in that first phrase there, Paul, the servant of Christ Jesus. Um, and there's probably a slight difference there. I mean, I, I assume if you said uh, Paul, a servant by Christ Jesus, um, the, the slight difference there would be if I'm a servant by someone, that can mean maybe you commissioned me, uh, told me to go do something, but I'm not doing it for you necessarily. Maybe you were just the, the third-party messenger. But to say he's doing it, he's a servant of Christ Jesus, means that my service is directed towards him, right? It's not, it's not just that he commissioned me to do some task over here. Um, I'm actually doing it in connection to my relationship with him, right, of Christ Jesus. At least that's a first thought that comes to mind. J.I. Packer. J.I. Packer. Yeah, if you have not read, I, this is out of curiosity, how many of you have read Packers knowing God. Ah, yeah, okay. Small handful. Um, th this is one of those books that, that, like, if I had a short list of books every Christian needs to read, this one makes that short list. Uh, knowing God by J.I. Packer. Um, if you haven't read it, you will greatly, greatly benefit from it. Um, so I'll put that out there. Oh, yeah, it's, uh, you can get it digital, you can get it print. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think, was it just, I think there was a new edition uh, just released, I think, uh, paperback. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay, yeah. Um, so I, I'll give you, a, uh, let, let's, talk, let's talk structure first. Um, I kind of like the idea. Several people have broken down the, the book of Romans in, in different ways. I want to give you one that is probably a little more simple. Um, and, and it's uh, it's really just four main points. So you have the opening, uh, which is verses 1 through 17 of chapter 1. And, and then chapter 1 through chapter 4 is the heart of the gospel, which is justification by faith. And then uh, the next four chapters are... Uh, the assurances from the gospel, the kind of the hope of salvation. Um, you know, chapter five, if you remember, starts out with uh, you are now you now are at peace with God uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ, and so there is this this hope held out uh, to those who have been justified by faith. Um, chapters nine through eleven are the the chapters on the the relationship with Israel, um, and and one uh, one theologian. Uh, defines this as the defense of the gospel because there is a problem here with Israel. Like, what do we do with them now um, kind of thing? And so he writes three chapters kind of in defense of the gospel for Israel. Um, and then the, the final, uh, well, not the final three chapters, but 12 through 15 is the transformational power of the gospel. Um, how does the gospel enter in and, and produce change in our lives in an everyday 
Uh, so a lot of times in Paul's writings, it, um, what, what he does is he will start out by focusing heavily on teaching, like doctrine. And then somewhere along the line, he shifts and starts to show uh, more specifically how that doctrine applies in our lives. And so maybe the, the clearest example of this is the book of Ephesians. In the book of Ephesians, he spends the first three chapters talking about the doctrine of the church, you know, the, the unity of the church, and, and, and what that means, the, the, uh, the, the, the calling of the church. And, and, and he spends three chapters just diving into this unity and who we are. And then at the start of chapter 4 and to the end of chapter 6, he's like, so therefore, right? So like, like I just gave you all this information, so now what? Well, let me tell you what, walk worthy of the calling that you've been called to, right? And, and then he gets into this really practical, like, what does this mean for our everyday lives? Um, in the book of Romans, that happens really starting in chapter 12 and through chapter 15, where he all of a sudden is like, let's just get intensely practical. Present your bodies a living sacrifice is how the section begins, right? Um, let's just talk about what this means for our daily life. And then from about the middle of chapter 15 to the end of the book is an extended closing of the book where the end of chapter 15 he kind of summarizes uh, a lot of, of what he's been saying in the book and mentions how he wants to come and visit Rome before he goes to Spain and then chapter 16 he just mentions a whole lot of people right um, thankful to this person and to this person and greet this person and uh, we just have this roll call of people who were meaningful in the life and ministry of Paul um, so that's that's kind of brief general overview uh, structure that we'll, we'll kind of try to follow as we go. The, the theme of the book, as I said earlier, the theme is a little bit more difficult to nail down. This is clearly a letter. This is clearly a letter um, about the doctrine of salvation. Some people have said that Romans is Paul's theology. Like he's just writing out all of his doctrine in Romans. That's not exactly it. Uh, because there's not really anything in the book of Romans on eschatology, right? Like, like you don't really find any well-defined um, theology of the future. There, there's not really much here on Christology. You know, who is Christ? We, we got this brief statement in the beginning about who he is, son of God, son of David, but he doesn't really expound on that at all. What he does expound on is the doctrine of salvation. Um, how does it come to us? Why does it come to us? What are its effects? right? How do we receive it? Um, and we talk about justification and adoption and sanctification and unification, all of these things that the gospel brings about in our lives. So the overarching theme seems to be Paul just laying out his understanding of the doctrine of salvation. Um, and again, the reason behind that is not only for the well-being of the church in Rome, because it seems like they were doing pretty well already, but to lay out this defense as almost a, a missions letter to go, I need to get to Spain, and, and Rome is the most logical place to be the center of opposition. Uh, you're the capital of the known world. The church is doing really, really well. Um, and, and, and on the flip side, when he, uh, when he moves into Central Asia and, and you know, is, is trying to make inroads into Greece and uh, Macedonia and some of these other areas, he makes Ephesus his home base. Like, that's where he keeps coming back to. That's where he spends the most amount of time. That seems to be the center of his activity that allows him to launch into these other major cities and ports around that part of the world. Now that he wants to get to Spain, Rome is the most logical uh, center of operations. And so he's writing this, this defense of the gospel, um, Paul's perception, Paul's theology of the doctrine of the gospel to a church that could become his home base. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's great. Uh, because, because essentially what Paul's about to do um, from about the midpoint, like he's going to, by, by, by verses 16 and 17, he's going to give us like, boom, here's the gospel, right? I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God, 
right? And that kind of becomes the, that verse um, kind of becomes the undergirding theme verse for the rest of the book. But then after that, he's going to launch right into the problem of sin. Uh, like, like, and he's going to say, hey, listen, everybody is condemned under sin. Gentiles are condemned by sin. And then chapter 2, he's going to be like, religious people, Jews, you're condemned under sin, right? Uh, but then he's going to resolve that in chapters 3 uh, through 6 and beyond, uh, the salvation that is available, and then, yeah, the service part of it. How does that motivate us? Uh, how does that change us to serve the Lord? I like that. Simple. Anything else? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, are you talking about other books in the Bible where that becomes evident? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can see it in Acts. A- Acts will say things like, like Paul w- was here and he was preaching the gospel in the synagogue, but Jews from such and such a town came over, right? And, and they stirred up the people. Uh, like, you can just see it happening. Um, they seem to be dogging Paul. And, and then word starts to spread, like, hey, this guy, he's a troublemaker. Um, but, but Paul, you remember Paul's pattern uh, through most of Acts is that when he would show up in a new town, where would he go first? He'd go to the synagogue first, right? Why? Because Jesus had even said the, the gospel is to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. And so... Paul took that very literally, and so when he would go to a town, if there was a synagogue, that's where he would go first. Um, but the Jews, man, they had mixed responses, and a lot of them resisted uh, the message, which, again, is consistent with what happened with Jesus' own ministry. He came into his own, and his own received him not. Um, Paul's ministry reflects that. He would keep going to his own people, and, and by and large, those people rejected him. Um, and then he would shake the dust off his feet and go to the Gentiles. Um, and was and was really in some ways pushed more and more in that direction um, as his ministry went along. Yeah, well, I think you see um, probably that emphasis most clearly in the book of Galatians, right? When, when he writes the Galatians, he's like, oh, foolish Galatians. Or like, how quickly have you fallen away? Um, the main point behind the book to Corinth, uh, it, it seems pretty clear, is there were, there were divisions in that church. Um, you know, I remember the indictment early on is some say I'm of Paul, some say I'm of Apollos, some say I'm of Jesus. He's like, knock it off, right? Uh, stop choosing sides. We're, we're all we're all believers, and if you can't get there, it's because you're carnal, you're fleshly, uh, which was Paul's way of saying you're you're not even in Christ, right? Like like you're still living uh, in the deadness of your own sin. So so he was approaching Corinth very much um, for the purpose of you have divisive um, veins running through. Uh, your body, and it's going to destroy the entire body for that church. So uh, slightly different themes, but Galatians, uh, I think for sure, makes that very clear. All right, go one more. One more. Yeah, so we, we don't really know. Um, I mean, I mean, probably by this point, we're, we're talking 55 to 58 A.D., um, I, think, I think most people would assume that's pretty close to Paul's age um, because he, he's, in, in the book of Acts, again, when, when Stephen gets stoned in Acts chapter 7, Paul is there holding the cloaks for the men who are the decision makers. 
um, which would seem to, to indicate that Paul is probably still rising through the ranks. He's probably a young man still at that point, late teens, early 20s probably. Um, uh, and, and then, so, so generally, if I remember this correctly, generally in, in, in Israel's life, a public servant, someone who would serve as a religious leader, uh, like, a, like a priest or something like that, generally that service didn't start until you're 30. That's when they would consider you uh, mature enough, well-versed enough to do that. So probably Paul is pre-30 then. So, so now we're probably looking 25, 30 years removed from that. He's probably in his 50s or 60s at this point, but that is speculation at best. As far as what happens to Paul, um, there, are, there are writings that indicate that he was ultimately beheaded in Rome. Um, so, but, but, but again, we, there's no biblical account to know. He, we know he's imprisoned in Rome, but that's how the book of Acts ends. And so there's this big mystery, like, like why in the world would Luke stop the book of Acts without telling us what happened to Paul? I mean, he was two-thirds of this book, and now it just stopped. Uh, which is a really helpful reminder that the book of Acts isn't really about Paul at all. It's about the acts of Jesus, not the acts of Paul. Um, but it leaves this mystery open. Some people believe that he was beheaded by Nero in Rome. Um, that's probably fairly likely. But there is a significant movement in, in some research that believes that Paul actually was released from Rome and made it to Spain. Uh, we just don't have any biblical record of that at all. Uh, so the fact that, and th there's a number of things that they mention, one of them being that it's just really hard to believe that Luke would not have at least written an addendum to say, and Paul eventually was executed. If that's actually what happened, it's really hard to believe that he would not have mentioned that. And so that's led people to, to kind of dig around and speculate that he perhaps made it out and maybe, maybe got to Spain, lived out the rest of his life there, but we really have no idea. We're not going to know until we get there. Yeah, no idea. So. Yeah, I don't know that he was specifically a part of the Sanhedrin yet. Um, he was definitely on track, I think, to end up there. So the Sanhedrin was the, the kind of the governing religious body. Um, yeah, but we don't know for sure whether he was. Um, some people look at, you know, when he refers to Timothy, he calls Timothy my son in the faith. Uh, but that's clearly referring to the fact that Timothy was converted under Paul's ministry. Um, I, I don't think, I don't think we have any indication anywhere in the scripture that Paul actually took a wife at any point. As a matter of fact, um, is it Corinthians where he's laying out his apostleship? He's like, did we not have the right to take a wife? He's like, I had the right to marry, but I, but I chose not to. Um, so it, it seems like that, um, at least the indication of what we hear from Paul, what we know of Paul, I don't think he was ever married. Possibly he was a widower, but I think that's more speculation than not. What we do know for sure is that, um, you know, contrary to some um, – who, who say that religious leaders, a.k.a. priests, should not marry, Paul's like, listen, I'm an apostle. I, I have the right to marry. But, again, in his mind, he's saying, I choose not to uh, because he's just he's given in service to the gospel. And it's like he says uh, later in First Corinthians, he's like, hey, if you're not married, stay unmarried. <laughs> but because they'll, they'll seek a wife, because not because that's not good, but because once you are married, you now have responsibilities that tie you to earth, right? And they're good and right and righteous responsibilities. But if you can remain unmarried, you have a level of freedom to serve the Lord. Um, you know, like Paul, to just pack up and go to Spain if you wanted to, uh, without having to worry about, uh, you know, taking care of the family or being away from family. Um, so, yeah, Paul's like, hey, if, if you could remain unmarried and serve the Lord, man, that is such a benefit to the church. Uh, we've gotten that also a little backwards. We, we've so elevated marriage that I think it feels we tend to make non-married people feel isolated um, and like they're second-class citizens in some way because we're always asking them when they're going to get married. Um, listen, let's 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 rejoice in the fact 
that there are unmarried among us um, because they've got some they, they've got some freedom that the rest of us don't have. So, all right. Well, we went from almost ending early to now we're ending late, um, and I just blame Helen for all of this. So, <laughs> all right. Let's pray. We'll get out of here, Father. Um, once again, so much for us just to just to think on. Um, help us to remember the importance of what it is that we we were discussing. Um, even even may the words of uh, Martin Luther kind of ring in our ears a little bit this afternoon. That um, it would be good for every Christian to just know this book inside out, to know it word for word by heart, um, and that we can never read it or ponder over it too much. And Lord, I pray that the more we deal with it, the more we talk about it, the more we remember and read it, the more precious it will become to us, the better that it will taste. And Lord, I pray that it would be a nourishment to our souls. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thanks, folks. Thank you.